Well, hello, I am Matt Williamson. Let's dig in. We are going to put a bow on the Steelers' predictable but upsetting loss to the Jags. A couple more notes there, not a lot. And then I want to introduce you to the Titans, who are going to be here any minute now, right? So, re-watching Jacksonville game, even better than I thought, and I just put him in the stud category, is Trevor Lawrence. I mean, the way he handled the game, layered throws, took something off, took something, put a little extra on it, just threw the football extremely well, handled the elements without problems, processed, got the ball out of his hands. He's knocking on the door of becoming an elite quarterback, as many expected coming out of school, but... Took him a little while to get there, um, but boy, he's he's really something. I mean, I guess that's the, the quickest way to put it, and beating guys like that's really hard to do. Um, two Steeler defensive linemen watching that were even better than expected. I've really warmed up to Adams. Man, he plays hard. He's playing a lot of snaps. He's disruptive. He's consistently stringing good games together. So Adams has really exceeded my expectations. And I thought Liao had a good game, too. You know, Liao contributed, impacted the game. We'll get the snap counts here in the middle, in a minute. Um, I also urge you, my article is up this week, mostly talking about what Minka Fitzpatrick means to the defense. But it also leads me to three Steelers that I put in the really bad category. KZ. I mean, KZ and Neil are not really starting safeties. I think they're number threes that are now going to masquerade as a one and two. KZ had a tough game. Mason Cole had yet another tough game. Allen Robinson had yet another tough game. Putting Robinson and Cole out there, I know there aren't a lot of other options at center are problematic. I mean, it just are. These guys have had bad years, Allen Robinson and Mason Cole. I still lobby heavily. Replace Robinson snaps with Austin. I understand you lose a ton in the blocking game, but he's bringing very little to the table. Um, wanted to address one thing else that I was encouraged about. Um, five snaps of Broderick Jones as a sixth offensive lineman. Now, I look at this two ways. Great. Bring in more. Gr great way to get the rookie more snaps, more physicality at the line of scrimmage. Your tight end position is a little in flux too, you can, so that helps with that situation. But I also look at it like, why did it take this long? It's Halloween. I mean, you draft this guy that moved up in the middle of the first round, early to middle of the first round, and I've been calling for this since the draft. You know, like whoever wins the left tackle job, either Moore or Jones should play a ton of extra snaps as a sixth offensive lineman. Why did we just, just dawn on them now to do that? I, I don't understand that at all. Because especially last year, 2022, they did it very, very little. But I excused it because their depth offensive linemen were junk. I mean, they, I don't want to strut out those guys. But the previous seasons, which was also Matt Canada here for at least one of them, they were like the top of the league. They were like 5 or 6% of their snaps had an extra offensive lineman. So this isn't new to this team. It just took a year off. Why did it take so long? And I'm glad it's here. So there you go. Talked a lot about the offensive snaps yesterday. Let's talk about defensive. Here's, here's the corner distribution. Peterson played 71. Porter played 59. That's out of a possible 71. So Peterson never left the field. I think we're going to get used to that. I think you'll see more safety, more nickel, especially when Wallace returns. Porter and Wallace on the outside. Peterson is your jack of all trades. But doesn't look like he's going to leave the field a lot. Maybe he will with Wallace. We'll see. Um, Porter was at 59. Sullivan at just 28. Great. Pierre at 9. Okay. That, that'll go away once Wallace returns. I mentioned the safety situation. Minka left after only 8 snaps. Therefore, Neil played 69. KZ played 67. That is not what you want. Killebrew was out there for 12 because um, they still do want to play some big nickel, but you're really scratching the bottom of the barrel there. The inside linebackers played really well. Um, here's how they distributed those snaps. 
Holcomb played 64 out of 71. Alexander played 38. Roberts played 31. I think that's like perfect. It's exactly how you want to distribute those. On the edge, Highsmith outsnapped Watt 63 to 56. Golden with 14. Herbig with 9. Again, really good distribution. D line, Ogunjobi played 53. Adams played 49. I mean, I know he's on a typical nose. And I just talked about him a minute ago, but that big, that big sucker is playing 49 snaps a game. Benton at 30. It's up a little bit. I'd still like to see it keep going. Watts at 28. I think they're recognizing that he's played quite well in that, such a role. Liao, as I mentioned, at 14. And Loudermilk at 9. Um, last thing we got here on Steeler game, or the, the last game, they lost about 13% chance of making a pl- making the playoffs with this loss. They now sit around 45% chance of being a playoff team. I'm almost certain, though, that if it ended today, which is kind of an odd way of seeing things, they would be in. I think they're the fifth seed right now with all the um, tiebreakers and whatnot. Um, so there you have it. Um, let's... Take a little break. I'll get a sip of water and I'll introduce you to the Titans. So there are some similarities between Tennessee and Jacksonville. Some of them don't matter former division opponent. There's kind of a storied history here. These teams used to meet a lot. Known for their physicality, Eddie George, McNair, Derrick Henry, Earl Campbell. I mean, so I think that is kind of the persona of this team. It's certainly Vrabel's persona. Their defense, much like Jacksonville, is a pass funnel. They're really good at taking away the run. They're hard to run on. But their back seven can be had. Um, the offense is going to break in Will Levis again. And he did some good things. People are getting ahead of themselves on Levis. That's more of a conversation for tomorrow, though. Here's just some basics about the Titans. Uh, they're winless on the road this year while the Steelers are 2-2 two and two at home. The, t- the Titans have been, scored, have been outscored by eight points this year. Pittsburgh has been outscored by 34 Steelers are plus seven in turnover differential. Only the Bucks are better. And I saw something today that I've hesitated to bring up, but no team in the league has gained more EPA, expected points added from take o- takeaways than the Steelers. Anyway, Tennessee is at minus two in turnover differential. Jacksonville is the only team with more takeaways than the Steelers. While Tennessee has only taken away the ball six times and two of their interception, then their two interceptions are easily the fewest in the league. So let's stop there. That's a big difference between these defenses too, is Jacksonville makes you throw and then they take it away. Tennessee makes you throw and they don't take it away. No team has recovered more fumbles than the Steelers. Pittsburgh does have five more giveaways than the Titans, who have lost just two fumbles through seven games. Tennessee possessed the football for just under 33 minutes last week against Atlanta, but for the season, they're just under 30 minutes. They're 29-27, which obviously league average is 30. Pittsburgh comes in at 26-54, dead last in time of possession. Under 27 minutes a game of possession. Really bad. The Steelers' offense runs just 59.3 plays per game. Only four offenses run fewer, but one of those is Tennessee. The Titans' offense runs just 57.1 plays per game. Denver is the only one running less. In turn, the Steelers' defense is on the field on average for 68.1 plays per game. That is fourth most. But Tennessee's defense only averages 63.4 snaps per game, which is right dead middle 16th. Titans games, as you might imagine by hearing that, of all the 32 teams, their games have the fewest snaps per game. So they shorten it, they muddy it up, kind of in the Steelers mold. 
the 28 points that they scored last week was a season high for the Titans. Mike Tomlin, 22 and 5 against rookie quarterbacks. Every team in the AFC now has between two and six wins and between two and six losses. Meanwhile, the AFC North is the only division in the NFL that doesn't have a team with a losing record. So the Steelers sitting there with four wins are just as close to the worst team in the AFC as they are the best team in the AFC in terms of standings. The Titans' opponents are passing for 51.3 more yards per game than Tennessee this season. And overall, they produce just under 41 more yards per game. So you can imagine this isn't so swell for the Steelers, though. Pittsburgh's opponents are throwing for 53.4 more passing yards and 57.4 rushing yards per game. So every game, the Steelers are getting outrushed by 57 plus yards and getting out outthrown by 53 plus yards which, of course, results in a negative 109.4 yardage differential per game. So every every game they're getting, they're allowing well over 100 more yards than their opponents. The Steelers' opponents have also produced 39 more first downs than the Steelers. In terms of turning a new set of downs, in, uh, turning a set of downs, you know, they punt two, you get the ball, whatever. How often do you turn that into a new set of downs? The Steelers, is thir- the Steelers' offense is 30th. Tennessee's offense is 26th. We'll preview the game more tomorrow. I um, think you have a pretty good idea <laughs> of what to expect in this thing. It's going to be low-scoring, slow-paced, a battle. So, be back in a bit. Over and out. <laughs>